Good morning, everyone. So what I'm going to try and do today is paint you a picture of what the ecosystem for technology commercialization looks like here in Columbus, and also give you an idea about intellectual property and why you should care about it. Uh, so I'll keep it you know, a little high level. And please um, ask me questions anytime. You can stop me anytime. I don't mind at all. Um, I don't punch in 50, 60 slides, so there's, there's a few number of slides here, but it's supposed to be more interactive so I can get your input and, and uh, address some of those, um, those questions. Um, so um, as it was mentioned before, I've been in this intellectual property business, not so much in tech transfer, uh, but uh, have seen some of the challenges of technology transfer and what, what it means for, for us to take technology to market. So, Building an ecosystem is probably the most important thing that one can do in ensuring that these technologies go to market. And in that, in the Columbus ecosystem, we have some, some phenomenal partners that I do want to mention about uh, before I get started. So let me start with Rev1 Ventures, and uh, if you would raise your hand, Moo. Uh, so we have a representative from, from Rev1 Ventures, and it is an important element because you need funding for starting companies. And Rev1 uh, manages a number of funds, and some of those funds we are, as Ohio State, we are limited partners, as in we have provided money in those funds, so we are really close partners. There's a lot of educational um, elements that Rev1 captures, which I think should be important for a lot of you if you are thinking of becoming an entrepreneur. Let me go next. Uh, the Advanced Reach program is uh, really a fantastic program on campus where you know women in commercialization, uh, the numbers show that we are lacking and we should be doing a lot more. So that is a program that has been uh, very successful in increasing the number of invention disclosures, getting you know, women entrepreneurs towards um, that goal of commercialization. And Carolyn Crisofulli, who's here, um, is um, working as an executive in residence, both at the Technology Commercialization Office and also as an EIR for the advanced program and has been doing a wonderful job on campus in uh, reaching out to a lot of inventors and entrepreneurs. Let me also mention the Center for Design Manufacturing Excellence. An idea, there are lots of ideas, and most of those ideas never make it to market, unfortunately. Uh, but if the idea can be prototyped, then that can be a tangible thing that you can show to others. It's very important to do the proof of concept, the proof of principle. And Center for Design Manufacturing Excellence, uh, please, if you would raise your hand right there. Uh, so representative is there. Oh, two of them are there. And so we have materials uh, in the back as well. So with that, let me jump into uh, what we do and why we do things um, in intellectual property. So this is a slightly dated slide, uh, but I think it, it, it gets the point across. If you look at the S&P 500 companies, which are the most valuable companies that we have in the United States, if you look back in the 1970s, only about 17 to 20% of companies' valuation was intangible assets. Fast forward 30 years, 80% of a company's valuation is intangible assets. Now, what does that mean for our economy? I, I just saw the news today. Uh, the stock market has been doing phenomenally well. So for the first time, the S&P 500 company market cap crossed $20 trillion. That's with a T. That's a very large number. Do the math. 84% of that is intangible assets. It's a very large number. So we think that we are building these, these plants, these you know, warehouses, these buildings, that's not where the value is. Just to give you an example, if you compared Airbnb, how many people have booked rooms through Airbnb? Oh, wow. This is, this is a very technology savvy crowd that I'm talking to. So if you look at the valuation of Airbnb and Hyatt, Airbnb actually beats Hyatt. How many buildings does Airbnb have? Zilch. Okay. 
So what is the valuation of the company? It's basically apps, right? It's, it's software. So I can go on and on. Facebook, Google, Uber. How many taxis does Uber have? Zero. New York is basically putting the taxi business out. Now people go with Via and Uber all the time as opposed to taxis. So the valuation of those companies is nothing but intangible assets. It might be patents, it might be trademark, it might be software, know-how, all of those elements. But the valuation, last time we had checked on the math, it was five and a half trillion dollars was the intangible assets. Now it's increased quite a bit, as I mentioned to you, 84% of that um, 20 trillion dollars is a very large number. Now if that does not convince you, let me give you some other numbers. Um, so how many people think Microsoft is a software company, a hardware company, or other? Software, hardware. Other, okay, more other. So you, you probably got the hint. So let me show you some numbers there. So Microsoft made $2 billion in pure patent licensing. That was 70% of their revenues and 94% of the gross margin in 2014 in a quarter. Okay, and you thought Microsoft did hardware and software. Most of that licensing came from Android patent licensing. It's a very small group. And so the major business for Microsoft is patent licensing, okay? Technicolor, um, for some of us, you might re remember RCA, the television company that became Technicolor, and they have a large portfolio of patents to the tune of about 30 to 40,000 patents, okay? They, on a yearly basis, do about 100 to 200 million euros in patent licensing. Let me give you another data point, Qualcomm. So if you look at the news today, Qualcomm got an unsolicited offer from Broadcom today, $105 billion, okay? What do you think is the business of Qualcomm? You're getting the hint. 80% of their profits in 2013 came from just pure patent licensing, no products. It's all intangible assets. And if that does not get the point across, the blue chip company IBM, um, for IBM to make their profits and their, the goals that they meet today without doing patent licensing, they were the pioneers in patent licensing in this business, they would have to sell $20 billion worth of services and stuff just to make that up, which is almost impossible for an IBM. IBM started the patent licensing business with about, about four people, and they on a yearly basis do about $1.4 to $1.8 billion in just naked patent licensing. Okay. So a lot of these companies that we think of today, which are product and services companies, are really intellectual property companies. And the model, the sophistication of intellectual property strategy, it's not about making money, believe me. Although I'm talking about money here, it's all about impact. And that's what the technology transfer business does, the technology commercialization business does. That's what our main motivation is. So let me then show you what uh, the, the world of R&D kind of looks like, the chart looks like. That large bubble right there is us, okay? We still, uh, this is a Battelle study. Uh, uh, I urge everyone in this room who is involved with research and intellectual property and commercialization to look at that, that study because that gives you the big picture, what's going on in the world. Now, this bubble is, you know, we expect that. But this bubble right there, the yellow bubble in China, a lot of people did not expect that. In fact, when China came out about six or seven years back and said they would have the most number of patents, they were not kidding. So today, if you look at the most number of patents by any country in the world, it's not us, it's China. And that's not the only nation which is coming up in terms of intellectual property strategy and protection of rights. So 
If you combine the Asian bubbles right here, what that represents is a shocking number that I, that I will give to you. So the Innovation 1000 companies in the world spends about $680 billion in R&D dollars. Just to put that in perspective, we, US universities, spent $68 billion in R&D funding last year. So it's about 10x of what we do in the Innovation 1000 companies. For the first time last year, North America was not the leader in R&D expenses as of last year. 35% is what we did, 37% was Asia. So people are getting the hang of it, you know, that intellectual property is the way to go, it's not just manufacturing things, it's the value added manufacturing, it's the, it's the intellectual property that creates more value for a product, okay? You don't want to be in the commodity business, you want to be in the value added business, and that's what, that's what the game is. So, What's happening is a number of things. You know, China, I, I single, you know, I'm pointing out at China, but there's lots of other economies which are coming up as well, but China is definitely one of them uh, in the forefront. The second factor is the attack on our intellectual property system. So if you, if you follow the patent regulations, the policies that, that are changing, that's been under attack for the last five years or so. So that is having a tremendous negative impact in our innovation business. Declining R&D, I just mentioned that. Outsourcing of R&D is another area that I just also uh, mentioned. So we are outsourcing a lot of our R&D to other economies. Um, and the lack of the public-private partnership. So you need for commercialization, technology transfer to happen, it cannot be done single-handedly. That's why I mentioned about the ecosystem. It's important to have those partnerships. We in Ohio happen to have a very um, um, uh, helpful state government where the third frontier has provided us tremendous amount of resources towards the startup and innovation economy. So we are lucky that way. So let me then move along and tell you how the technology transfer business came into being. So uh, bipartisan um, um, legislation called the Bayh-Dole Act in 1980, so Senator Birch Bayh and Bob Dole uh, created this act by which all federally funded research done at the university would be owned by the university. Why was that done? Well, previous to 1980, what happened was all of this research was being done, but none of this IP was going to the market. They were all locked in. So when the Bayh-Dole Act was created, uh, it, it kind of exploded the, the whole technology transfer field. And I will show you some of the numbers which are actually quite staggering, the impact that it has had on uh, technology commercialization. I don't know if you can read those numbers, but I'll read some of those numbers to you. So this was 1996 uh, to 2013, a study done by the Bio Organization, which is a very credible organization, as you know. $518 billion of U.S. gross domestic product. That's the impact from university technologies in that period of time. So it's not a small number. $1.1 trillion on the U.S. gross industrial output. Just in 2014, 965 new products that year were created. Uh, more than 80,000 US patents over the past 20 years, 3.8 million jobs created from university technologies. And then this number is now substantially higher, about 5,000 startups created at that point in time. That number is more than 8,000 startups now. And um, my colleague, Cheryl Turnbull, is going to talk more about startups right after me, so I'm not going to spend too much time on the startup side of things. But it's, it's, a, it's an important part of our overall economy. Uh, and then if you look at um, this number would be a very important number. So 153 new drugs and vaccines are on the market because of university research, because of the translation of the research, which CCTS plays obviously a very important role in that overall 
ecosystem as well. At one point in time, a Boston University colleague, uh, Ashley Stevens, wrote, wrote an article uh, and tracked the, the, a decade of um, uh, products coming to market, drugs and vaccines, and more than 80% of all pharmaceutical approved products in the market during that decade were from universities. So pharma does a lot of research, but the fundamental research happens right here at the universities. So it's an important element of our economy, and I think the numbers speak for themselves. Um, and if you look at uh, the overall um, sort of net sales in a single year, uh, so this was 2014, $28.7 billion of sales happened because of university IP. So a lot of times we get, uh, you know, very focused on the revenue numbers for university tech transfer. And I'll demystify how those numbers are not the numbers that we should be looking at. Tech transfer as a business is very much misunderstood. So I hopefully will be able to demystify some of that. So this is what our business is today. Professor gets NIH dollars, invention is created, that invention gets um, to us through an invention disclosure process at the Technology Commercialization Office. So the solution comes in, and then we go try to seek what the problem is. Make a fit of the solution. So it's fundamentally a reactive business and also fundamentally a business that needs to be flipped around. So Technology transfer needs to be flipped around, and what we really need to do is we need to figure out what the problems are on the commercial scale. Clearly, the, the research that is being done, and as you saw the numbers, you know, if it's, if it's getting 150 plus products in the market, there's something right that we are doing. But a lot of times, the research that we are doing is not typically directed to translating that technology towards a market problem, and that's really where we can, we can make an impact, and I say we because, you know, CCTS, again, plays an important role uh, in, in demystifying that and bringing some of those commercial challenges to the faculty, to the researchers at the university. So changing that paradigm, it's, it's really a shift, a cultural shift. Uh, in our own small way, we are trying to bring in uh, researchers from the commercial side who can connect to the upstream research that we are doing, to the downstream product development. Um, and we do these um, fireside chats where by bringing in, having a, an open dialogue between our researchers and the commercial side. But that's really, you know, that, that is a fundamental challenge in technology transfer that we face every single day. So what is the process of tech transfer? Everyone talks about tech transfer as if it's, it's this one bundle thing. It is a complicated process, and believe me, each one of these could be broken down into probably 30 to 50 steps that we have to go through every single day, and I see some of my colleagues nodding their heads because that's what they go through every single day. So the pipeline, this is really what drives us. We are a services business in technology commercialization. We are there to serve the researchers, and this is, the pipeline is, is sort of our raw material, so the, the inventions that happen, that come in. Just to give you a sense, we track uh, the number of meetings that we are doing on a monthly basis. Last month, we did about 280 one-on-one -on -one meetings with our licensing managers in that month. So it, it's, it's a lot of work to go out and reach out to the researchers, uh, researchers and find out what kind of research they're doing. Uh, but that's where, that's where our pipeline is. Then we do an evaluation. The evaluation is really a three-step process. We look at three specific things. We look at the technology and the landscape of the technology, which in most cases, the researcher knows what that technology landscape would look like. The next is we look at the intellectual property landscape. So uh, what do the patents look like? Can you get a patent for that technology? Is it unique? Is that specific element of the technology unique? And so we go through and take a very close look at that. And last, but very importantly, the market. 
So we take a look at what market exists. So if you are talking about medical device market, it really doesn't matter. You need to go down to the sub, sub, sub segment of that market and say, specifically, if you're looking at a bioresorbable stand, you know, what is that market going to look like? What market need does this technology address? So that's kind of the analysis that we do. So that's our evaluation process. Then we look at the protection, which is essentially the patent. Uh, most of the time, I would say 95% of the time, it's just patents through which we are protecting it. But there's, there's, there's a science and an art involved in that. If it's a pharmaceutical, which market should you protect that technology in? So there's an international patent strategy because it's, you know, there's, there's a cost benefit analysis as well. We don't have unlimited budget. So on a yearly basis, uh, the Ohio State University spends about $4 million in patent. That sounds like a large number, but it really is not because we've got thousands of patents that we have to maintain. And last year, we got 451 new inventions that year. So that's a healthy number right there. So we have to manage that entire portfolio, and that's where the protection comes in. Very importantly, the marketing of that technology. How can we get this technology to the right people at the right companies? So there's, there's a process which we go through, and I will share with you a little bit of that, but understanding who is it that would be interested at a Bristol-Myers Squibb um, in that organization. What do they look for in their pipeline? What does their phase three, phase two, and phase one pipeline look like? Where will this fit in? So there's a lot of thought process that goes into deciding who it should go to as a company um, and what position should it hit, what information is in, in that whole uh, marketing brochure that is being sent to them. And then, very importantly, the deal making of that technology. What are the market drivers? You know, if you're you know, licensing an Alzheimer's early stage preclinical drug, what are the market drivers and what should what should go into that negotiation process. Uh, we go, go through valuation sometimes. So we go through the three kinds of valuation of intellectual property, cost-based, market-based, and income-based approaches of valuating the, the particular technology. And it's a very involved process. And, but in certain cases, we will go through that process to go in front of the other entity. So that's, that's kind of you know, the, the process of tech transfer in, in two and a half minutes. Um, but what we are doing now is we are tracking metrics because metrics don't lie, right? So we have every area that, that you saw, uh, pipeline evaluation, deal making, startups, we track the input metrics as in how many faculty members are we meeting with. The output metric would be the number of disclosures. So there has to be a positive correlation, right? So we are tracking those every day, every week, every month trying to see where are the efficiencies and where are the inefficiencies in our processes. So this is more of a process engineering map that you see that we've um, basically started tracking over the last eight or 10 months. Um, just to give you a little bit of a blend of best practices, so we've gone high and low in search of the best practices. This is not rocket science. But you know, there, there is art in doing technology commercialization. So we've, we've gone to some of the best universities in the country who've been doing it for the last you know, two, three decades and, and talked to them uh, in terms of everything. So just to give you a sense, um, um, we have um, started an executives in residence program, which is we have now 15 EIRs. As I mentioned to you, Carol and Chris Afuli is one of our star EIRs. Um, and we have, uh, we have this program to essentially try and see if experts in that industry would come and take a look at our technology and try to help us in getting to market. In, in, um, in some certain scenarios, they might become the CEO of that company. In other scenarios, they might be just assisting us in taking those technologies to market. Um, we are doing some targeted marketing, so we use the database that, that any other company would use. It's called Zoom Info. So I could go in and find out information about anyone in any company. If they have given a presentation and in the presentation, the last slide, their contact details is there, it's captured at Zoom Info. So 
So I could go in and find that's paid service. But just to give you a sense of what kind of information database, it's all about information and how you mine it and the external innov innovation that's happening, how can we tap into that? We are doing a lot of things in, in terms of marketing our technologies um, to, uh, to entities uh, through passive marketing subscription services. So just taking a look at all the best practices in, in industry and how can we change our side of operations and make it more efficient. So the new model for tech transfer that would propel us to the next step creating more public-private partnerships. That is a big, big thing. And right now we are talking at CCTS and talk about a public-private partnership. That, that's, that's a great one, right? So you are working with the federal government, the university, and then working with entrepreneurs and capital and all of the other elements that would, that would make it successful. Creating standardized deal structures. Uh, we are working towards creating standard deal structures for startups in software done by faculty. So that would be something that, that uh, I think will make our negotiation a lot easier because it's standardized, it's, it's, it's everyone can, can have the same deal structure. Um, increased use of industry university technology access fee-based models. So one of the things that we are trying to do is, again, for industry to be comfortable to work with us, how can we create more transparency for intellectual property terms as they are coming and working with us? And that's, that's probably one of the, the key impediments in creating that relationship um, and making it successful. Um, and both sides have to, have to sort of bend a little bit to, to make it happen. We are one of the pioneers in that model along with you know, Purdue, uh, Michigan, several others who are, who are starting to use that model. Um, and focus on a portfolio-based approach for startups and licenses. So let me give you some numbers which are, which are very humbling. So since tech transfer really took off since 1980, uh, if you track it to today, every invention disclosure which has been uh, disclosed at any university, only 0.1% of those inventions are quote unquote successful. By successful, I mean they have made a cumulative million dollars or more. So 0.1% of all inventions ever disclosed have been successful. Stanford is the number one in the nation in terms of success. And their number? It's about 8x of other universities. So it's 0.8% of Stanford inventions have ever been successful. Okay? So it's not that easy of a business to get technologies licensed and make hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Let me tell you one more data point. All the successful tech transfer operations which go out and make more than $100 million a year, there's one thing in common. Anyone want to take a guess what that is? If you made $100 million or more in one year in licensing revenue as a university, what is common with that? I heard drugs. Yes, that is correct. So you almost for sure have a drug molecule that hit, whether it's a Lyrica or a Remicade or an HIV cocktail or the Eli Lilly anti-cancer drug, or you can keep on going, but that's the common theme. And you take that one license away, 90% plus of the revenue is gone. So it's, it's an accidental success is what we are hoping for. So what is the solution to get technologies to market and us being successful in technology commercialization? I think you know, people in the community are thinking that it's startups, creating a portfolio of startups which are able to de-risk that technology and take it to market so it can be adopted. If you pick pharma, they like startups much more than they like early stage inventions because they are de-risked. So for the same invention that they would license from a university for $5 million, if you're lucky, they would come in and pay $500 million for that technology if it went to phase 2B or 2 uh, beyond that. 
So there, there's some intervention that's needed, that valley of death, that where we stand, it's too early for a company to come in and do the funding, and it's, it's too late, perhaps, for the federal government to come in and put in more, more money, because we'd we be just in that you know, perfect valley of death where nobody wants to fund it. What do you do? Well, that's where all the startup funds come in, and that's where the efforts that we are making towards creating more and more startups, again, it's a, it's a disciplined portfolio approach. The reason every one of us, I hope, we don't buy Tesla stock or, or you know, Fitbit stock, which I bought, by the way. Uh, that was a bad decision. Um, um, we don't buy that for our, our retirement fund. We buy mutual funds. It's a portfolio disciplined approach. The best fund that you can buy is still the S&P 500 index fund, okay? You can go do all the research. For, for us folks who are not able to invest in hedge funds, I think the S&P 500 index fund is probably the, the good way to go. Same thing with technology transfer. It has to be a disciplined approach of creating value through de-risking of technologies. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. So let me give you some math. So let's take a university which spends $10 million in tech transfer, okay? Has to be a large university to do that. 25% of the total revenues that come back to the university typically goes to tech transfer. So for breaking even, you need about $40 million coming back to the university on any given year for the university to break even. So get the math, right? Simple math. The average royalty is 1% to 2%. And this is not for the university. This is across all industries, all universities, early stage, late stage. I would actually say that number's probably a little bit higher on the medical side of things, on pharmaceutical side of things. But let's just take the industry kind of, you know, average across everything. So for making $40 million in a given year, for the university to break even in technology transfer at 2% average royalty rate, you're looking at $2 billion in sales from university IP in a given year to break even. You're talking about a Fortune 500 company kind of sales for every university which has a budget of 25%. So clearly, that's not going to happen every, every year for a university. To get to an impact, you really need a vehicle. And that vehicle, in my opinion, in a lot of our opinion in the tech transfer world, is you go through startups to make that impact in the marketplace. And creating jobs, making you know, the central Ohio region, the Columbus region, um, a place where we are not driven by low value commodity products, but really by high value intellectual property driven products. That's where you know, universities can have an impact. Um, and I think Cheryl's gonna cover a lot of uh, uh, the, the funds, so I'm gonna skip that part, but just a very high level um, um, sort of uh, comment on the, on the commitment that, that has been made by the Ohio State University, $100 million of our own money has gone into eight different funds that support startups. And that is kind of what is propelling us in creating a large number of startups, which we hope are going to be successful someday. Um, and as you see, some of those funds are managed by our partner organizations, Rev1. Um, and so it's, again, an ecosystem that drives this, this um, taking the technology to the next stage. Um, quickly, there are 69 active startups uh, today. And um, if you look at uh, our numbers, $2.8 million in our own money invested in these startups has attracted $143 million of capital to these startups. And 91% of that money has come from outside investors. So it's a good start for us 
but we are at very early stages of building this out. Um, it's, it's a long and difficult game to get technologies to market. It's a disciplined approach. You cannot rely on accidents. Then I'd be buying lottery tickets every day, but I don't. Uh, so so that's, that's kind of what you know, tech transfer is in, in, a, in a nutshell. These are some of our phenomenal, fantastic startups that have come out of the Ohio State University's uh, intellectual property. With that, I would love to take some questions from you. Thank you. Questions, comments, thoughts? Yes. Well, so, so there's a distinction, though. So if you are a student, so let's say you're an undergraduate student, you know, for discussion's sake. We have no ownership right in undergraduate student IP. If you're working as a graduate student in, in a research lab, then you are treated just like anyone else, any one of the other faculty. So you have a stake in that invention. About a third goes back to our inventors, so it's actually a very fair uh, way of uh, dealing with the revenues. Um, so, I don't know exactly what your situation was, but we, we typically divide those two up. So one is undergraduate students, where we are not really dealing with their inventions, although we have some thoughts and plans on how we can engage them in the ecosystem. For example, we have an associate program where we are bringing in about 25 to 30 uh, students in, in the TCO so that they get exposed to startups and they get exposed to due diligence and all of these things uh, to train them to become entrepreneurs down the road. Um, so, so undergraduates, we have absolutely zero stake in that. Uh, but if it is graduate students, then you're dealt just like a faculty or, or staff. Did I address your question? Well, it's a good thing because if you have your IP and you can, you can go out and do whatever you would like, then the university is saying that belongs to you. Now, on the other hand, you would probably want to have um, um, some part, you know, participation and partnership with the university, and that's a model that we are still working on. Other questions? Yes. The answer is 100%. We are very interested, to just to give you a, give you a sense. So in the recent uh, last three months, we've been working on creating a new kind of a marketplace. It's called the Buckeye Tech Smart. So it will be coming out soon, uh, by the end of the year. And we are targeting things such as copyright materials. We are exploring right now music and things that might not necessarily have an economic value, per se but it has impact, and how can we get that impact translated from the research? So, so we are very interested in that, and our hope is that this will become a marketplace where you would be able to put a lot of your research there that both you know, commercial and non-commercial interests could be served. What we would, we would do then is we provide the mechanism through which it could be transferred through a license. Because you don't want people to you know, take your you know, academic work and then put that into a, some commercial product and then making profit, right? 
So we create those licensing mechanisms and uh, the platform, so if it, if it could be sold for $2.99, let's say it's an app, right? We have created the credit card processing system, the iTunes store and the Android store, how we can sell that through that mechanism. So, so it's really a work in progress, but that's something that we're very interested in, in taking a look at. And, and that's why one of the things that we're doing is going out and meeting with a lot of faculty who traditionally have not been part of the commercialization ecosystem. Great question. Yes. Yes, so, uh, so I think College of Engineering has already adopted some of the metrics for P&T, uh, which include uh, patents, startups, commercialization. Um, I think it's still in its early stages, so it will be adopted, but it, there's definitely an interest, and I think other colleges, I, I don't know what is happening in College of Medicine, and maybe some of your faculty here would, would be able to talk about that, but um, um, I think there's definitely interest in, in including those metrics. Um, we are definitely very supportive of faculty members who are looking to create startups and you know, go that route. Uh, we work with quite a few of them and Cheryl Turnbull is actually our senior director of New Ventures and she's gonna talk uh, after me. Uh, so we, we are supporting a lot of the faculty effort on that side, but yeah, great question. Um, there's some universities, I, I think, who are getting on the bandwagon saying, look, the federal funding, if it stays constant, is actually declining. So there's got to be some other way where we can you know, bring in the resources uh, of research. And SBIR, we did an SBIR workshop where $2.5 billion a year is given out. Um, and you can tap into SBIRs if you have a company, right? So, so those are all things that, that we are looking at. Yeah, so we are, we are taking a much more active role, and in, in the near future, we will be taking a lot more active role. Uh, so SBIR, by definition, you, it's a small business innovation research, so you have to have a company, which is the primary in getting that grant. I, I believe there are 12 agencies in the, in the federal uh, system which give out SBIR. So, you know, DOE, NSF, NIH, these are all giving out SBIR money. Um, so there's, uh, there's three phases, phase one, phase two, and phase three kind of mechanisms for, for at least NIH. Um, there's a very strong tie-in with commercialization. So SBIR is given out so that you do not perform fundamental research. It's for product development. So there's certain milestones that you've got to meet and, and go through a process. But even then, um, the, the success rate of SBIRs is, is much higher than, say, for example, R01 grant. So there's a certain distinct advantages of getting SBIR. Um, so the point being, you need a, a small business and you need a university to partner with it uh, where most of the money actually goes to the small business and uh, about a third can come back to the university. So there's a split of two thirds, one thirds. If you go the STTR route, which is the you know, smaller brother of SBIR, then uh, it flips around. You can get more money coming to the university and less going to the company. But in either instance, it is a phenomenal mechanism for researchers to take a look at if you have aspirations for product development. And we are helping in that commercialization planning sitting down with the faculty, sitting, sitting down with, with the CEO and, and assisting them in, in, in that process. And that's where the New Ventures team actually plays a, a pretty important role in our office. It's not widely advertised, and maybe we should be doing a better job of advertising that, uh, but we're definitely assisting a lot of faculty in, in that. Mm -hmm. Correct. And so how does 
Very good question. So um, the intellectual property for phase one SBIR does not have to be actually licensed to the company yet. It can be optioned. So, so meaning that there's no definitive license as yet. So typically what happens is since it's a university IP that created that SBIR company, the university has certain amount of equity in that company. In other instances where you might actually have an external company which has no tie with the university at all, and that can also get a SBIR, that way the university is getting the more of the fundamental, the R part of the R&D is being done by the university and the D is done by the company. So that's kind of the split. And what happens then is universities able to work with the company in co-creating some, some of the ideas and intellectual property to that SBIR grant. But, but the, the ideal situation uh, where we would like to see this happen is where there's intellectual property at the university that's licensed to a startup and the startup goes out and applies for SBIR, the money comes in, part of the money goes to the startup, and part of the money comes back to the university lab to perform that research with the development work. Does that answer your question? Yes, but I think you can, you can understand um, from a faculty you know, point of view that the university is Well, the company is independent, so 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 that that's that's always the case, and you know we 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 just have a small percentage equity from the university side, uh, so the the company is independent, can do whatever it wants. Correct. Correct. So so you're probably doing some services work, but there might be other intellectual property that's created from that mechanism of SBIR that can then flow back into the company through a license. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, this might be, this is a better question for Cheryl to talk to a priest at the time. Okay. My experience so far in understanding of the PTO is with respect to the traditional patent licensing model, the business strategy or successful track record, also commercializing know-how of competitive years, for example. Yeah, so, um, Generally, it's done in combination. So the, the notion, not to get too much into detail, but we have a, uh, um, the notion of having a product license, um, so which includes the know-how and the patent combined. A naked know-how license has some challenges because once the cat is out of the bag, you can't get it back in. So there, there's some challenges with that, but it can be done. And frankly speaking, a lot of the software licensing is really know-how licensing if you look at it. Um, so yes, we are actively looking at that, and uh, we've been doing a change in our model uh, for getting know-how incorporated in a license. I'll be around for a um, little bit. Uh, I don't want to cut Cheryl's talk short, so thank you so much for your time and attention. I appreciate it. <laughs>